Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Thank you all. Yeah, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Ah, and that gives you perspective. You, we want you at the center, God. Colossians chapter 1. Let me read verses 21 to 23, and we pick up from this and move on in subsequent Sundays. Verse 21 says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. In order to present you, come on, say me. me. Everybody say it, say me. me. Holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which you have proclaimed, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a minister. We say this every Sunday. If you have your U version, version of the Bible, you can go download on the sermon notes and kind of stay in track with us so we can get to where God would have us to go. Let me... Um, Review briefly, and then we're going to walk through. Here is what I am hoping you would have learned by now. Five weeks ago, we kind of said, number one, that Christ is supreme over the cosmic realm. Um, for learning purposes, I just need you all to repeat that after me. Say, Christ is supreme, Christ is supreme. over the cosmic realm. Christ. Let me tell you what that means succinctly, abstracting up as fast as I can. He defied anything that existed above the earth realm and the spirit realm so he can come be with us, okay? The enemy has no power over him. I need you all to hear me carefully. Uh, and the second thing we understand is that he is supreme over the earthly realm. What that means, just in a summary format, is that Jesus defied the grips of death. He defied the best the enemy has to offer, and he arose from the grave victoriously with all power in his hand. Now, the thing I want you to, to track with me this morning is the fact that Christ reconciles all things to himself, and I'll just spend a few minutes dealing with that, so I want us to get that. Now, here I'm going to do this kind of, I want, I want you all to get this, okay? Say, Christ reconciled me. Christ. Say it again. Say, Christ reconciled me. Christ. So you must get in your mind that Jesus did all of this for you and for me in that he left his home in glory to travel to the earth realm to bring us back into a relationship with him. So by way of a big idea, here's what I'm hoping that you take away this morning. As a result of Christ's work of reconciliation, God presents believers acceptable to himself if they stand firm in the gospel they have received. Now, in case you don't get it, that's a shout right there. That, that really is. It's, it's an exciting thing. To know as a result of God's or Christ's work of reconciliation, God presents believers as acceptable to himself. And I'll talk briefly about that in a conditional clause, if they continue to stand firm in the gospel they have received. Baby, I love you, and this ain't got nothing to do with you, okay? I just need to say this. I thank God that he's not like my wife. That's why I apologized up front. He doesn't hold a record of my wrong. I know I'm going to get in trouble, but, but I want you all to get this, okay? That you stay faithful. When he looks at you, he doesn't see, let me go past tense, what you did. He sees what he did for you. Oh, Jesus. Y'all, that's a shout, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, y'all. That's, 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 that, now you understand why I so say, thank God. Well, not, let me, let me bring my wife back into, let me reconcile my wife, okay? So, y'all think, I thank God that he's not like church folk. That's even worse. I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about the church down the street, Okay. <laughs> I can't bring unsafe people into this because unsafe people are supposed to act like unsafe people, right? 
they're going to hold records of it wrong because they don't know any better. But let me just bring it a little closer. I thank God that he's not like my brothers and sisters. They're not here. How's that? Okay. That when he looks at me, he doesn't see what I did to him, but he sees what he did for me. Y'all, that's good news. Okay. That is good news. And I want, I want us to wrestle with that a little bit this morning because that's some important truth that I want us not to miss this morning. So we're going to walk through this. So here's the thing. Number one, I want us to understand that as believers, we have been reconciled to Christ. And I'll talk about what that words mean uh, in a little while. But we have been reconciled to Christ. And in a short form, we have been brought back into a right relationship with God. He forgives us. And he holds no records of wrong, okay? Now, here's the reason I had to spend so many time dealing with all those crazy theological terms. Look at 1B. Let me start at 1B, and then I'm going to work my way back up. Before reconciliation, hostility existed in mind, and I'll talk about that, in the mind which precipitated malicious behaviors, I'm going to say it again, then I'm going to read. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at other scriptures just to kind of help me solidify this point, and then we're going to end, okay? Before Christ did what he did, hostility existed in the mind, and it precipitated malicious behavior. So here's the thing. Before God reconciled you and I back to our relationship, um, we, we, we couldn't control ourselves in what we do because by default, we were all sinners. Does that make sense? Scripture puts it this way, wherefore by one man sin into the world and death by sin, so death pass it upon all because all have sinned. Here's the three things that I've been sharing with you. In the beginning when God created the heaven and the earth, God placed Adam and Eve, humankind, in this garden of Eden. And you need to understand with me, at that point in time, humankind was sinless. Are, come on, are this making sense? They were sinless. They were, in essence, in their perfect sense, absent sin. Hostility in the flesh was not something that existed in the human nature. They had a relationship with God. The enemy entered into the garden, and he tempted humans to sin, and as a result of the sin, they fell, and relationship with God was broken. Come on, is this making sense? Okay, so what sin did was it severed the relationship with God. Here's what you need to understand that I'm trying to get you to understand. In so many words, God stopped coming down in the garden. Okay, so here's how the Old Testament looked. Everybody could not access God for themselves. But because God was gracious and because God loved us, he established what was known as the priesthood in the Old Testament. And only one priest or the priest had to be from the tribe of Levi to have access for God. So what that means is that if we wanted forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament, somebody had to intercede on our behalf. Okay, so here's the theology that Christ, Paul is trying to present in the New Testament. Okay, the whole beauty of what happened in the New Testament, the plan of God all along was to reestablish Eden. Come on, say amen, y'all. Are you with me? His plan all along because God wants relationship with you and he wants relationship with me. He likes coming down in the cool of the garden and hanging out with us and having fellowship with us. That's what it's all about. So Colossians begin this way by saying for him to make it to earth, he had to go through the cosmic realm. Are you with me? Now, here's the reason I'm saying this to you. In the Old Testament, when your blessing was released, the possibility exists because Satan was in charge of the demonic realm, he could intercept your blessing. Come on, y'all seen this in Daniel 10. The prayer was released, but the angel, come on, intercepted the prayer. Here's the beauty of what I'm trying to share with you theologically with him being Lord of the cosmic realm. No demon could have intercepted him arriving in the earth to bless you. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Because he's Lord over the cosmic. And then he comes on the earth. And, and you're going to see this in a little while. And then he dies and he defies that because of you and because of me. And he emerged with all power in his hand. Come on, it's just making. Somebody say amen. 
he got up with not some power, but all power. And, 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 and here's what you got to understand. Hostility existed, number B, and his goal was to fix the problem of sin. Come on, say his goal was to fix the problem of sin. Real quick, go to Galatians. Real quick, y'all go. I just need to read this. And, and we have a lot of scriptures to look at, but I just want you to see a couple of things. Galatians chapter 5, and jump down to verses 16. Y'all bear with me as we read. I just need to read just a few scriptures, then we're going to talk. You there? Now, let me go fast, all right? Verse 16 says, Paul writes to the church of Galatians, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the sinful desires. Don't pay attention to that right now. Look at verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are what? Against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the what? Flesh. They are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Okay, so what that is saying in verse 17, by default, the flesh wars against the spirit. Okay, very, very important for you not to miss this. Now look at verse 18. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 19 says, now the works of the flesh are evident, and it lists them. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I did before, that those who do such things will not inherit one. And I don't need to read 22 because you kind of know that, all right? So here's the point that I want to make real quick. By default, we're messed up. Here's, here's, here's good news. When you blow it, don't be so hard on yourself. Just say, man, my flesh, it's winning the war. <laughs> I heard William McDowell said this the other day, and I, I really believe it's true. A lot of us say the fight is between the enemy and us. A lot of times I think it's really between you and you. <laughs> Are you with me? Because the enemy don't have to do nothing because the flesh is so strong. Okay? He only has to do things to those who have killed the flesh. But if your flesh is strong, guess what he does? He has you. Are you so before, before Christ reconciled us, we were hostile to him, and, and, and we couldn't help ourselves because by default we were sinners. Does this make sense? Okay, jump up to one, number one, okay? Now, reconciliation then becomes uh, it's necessary because we were alienated from God. Now, here's the thing I want you all to understand. Listen to me carefully. There was nothing you could do to get right with God. I want you to hear me because this is going to release somebody who's working really, really hard. <laughs> there is nothing you or I could do to get right with God because the flesh was reigning and by default we are all sinners. Does that make sense? You couldn't work your way in. You couldn't fix it. We couldn't do it ourselves. We needed God to do it for us. So what that says is reconciliation was necessary because you were alienated from God. Let me show you this real quick. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to move really, really quick because I want to hang out in, in six, um, Romans 6. Ephesians chapter 2, and jump down to verse 11. And if you want to read this later, you can go online at uh, Uversion and grab the notes and kind of look at all of this stuff. Let me read, let me read fast because I want y'all to walk with me. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Okay, now watch this. Therefore, I'm going to start laying some foundation. At one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the circumcision, uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you are at that time, what's the word? Separated from God alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's a dangerous statement. I need y'all to just love me this morning, right? Regardless of what I say and regardless of what I'm wearing. Okay. <laughs> Let me read that again because this is some crazy stuff. Remember that you, meaning me, were at that time separated from Christ, 
alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, he says, and without God in the world. Let me say it this way. Without God doing the work in us, for us, we are some hopeless creatures. I want you all to hear me. I need to say some, some, some difficult things, but I, I want you to hear the spirit of what I'm saying. Without God in me, doing the work through me and for me, I am a hopeless person. In other words, if I don't have God in my life, everything I do is futile. Most preachers will never say this today, but I'm going to say it. If you don't have God in your life, you're going to hell. It really don't matter what you stop doing because works don't save you. <laughs> so saying, I'm a good person, that doesn't mean nothing because your flesh is inherently evil. And if God is not in you, working through you, for you, it doesn't matter no how. So the text is clear in Galatians. We are considered uncircumcised, alienated from God, and separated from God with no hope in the world. So it takes Jesus doing something for us. Does this make sense, guys? Are you with me? Let me go, let me go to, to the other point because I want to land really quick, okay? So now here's this thing real quick. This is very, 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 very important. Christ's physical body was the vehicle of reconciliation. Let me tell you what that means. In the Old Testament, atonement was made when you sin, you would go to the priest, they would take a lamb or a goat or a bull, and they would kill that thing, and the blood of that thing sprinkled on the altar provided recompense for your sin. It was still symbolic. It, it didn't mean that you were actually forgiven because no goat, no sheep, no, no bull could pay the price for your sin. But it was a symbolism or a foreshadow of what was to come. Okay? So here's the beauty of this now. Listen to me carefully what I'm saying. Jesus comes into the earth. Well, let me back up. Here's the theology we were sharing before. God couldn't find a sinless person to take my place. I'm talking about me. So here's the word I'm going to use. He incarnated himself. He made himself flesh so they can kill him so he can die for me. Had he come in spirit form, salvation would not have been possible because you can't kill a spirit. You kind of get what I'm saying? So here's the beauty of what I'm saying. So he incarnated himself, and, and this is the beauty of the theology we've been teaching earlier. And even though you saw flesh, inside the flesh was fully God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And so Hebrews 9.22 says it this way, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So notice what Jesus did. He could have simply stayed in the earth, in heaven, and say, forgiven, 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 forgiven. He had power and ability to do this. But look at what the point says. He came in bodily form, and he allowed them to kill the body. And because he is Lord over the cosmos and the earthly realm, he said to the enemy, you can kill me, but you can't keep me down because I'm Lord over it. So his blood had to be shed. Let me say it differently. His body had to die. Everybody okay with me? Give me two seconds. Let's go over to Romans real quick. Uh, Romans chapter 7. Go there. Go there. We're almost there. Romans chapter 7, and jump down to verse 1. Yeah. Come on, say his body had to die. Say it again, say his body had to die. Now, the reason I'm having you repeat these things is, is, is we have varying learning styles, and I want you to get this. Now, listen to what I'm going to read. Verse 1, or do you not know, brothers, I'm in the ESV, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Make sense? Come on. In other words, you can keep me locked up in prison as long as I'm alive. 
So some prisoners understand the principle and they kill themselves to be released from prison. So those that they want to stay in there, they put them under what's known as suicide watch so they can't kill themselves. Y'all going to get this in a little while because the enemy has some of us under suicide watch to prevent us from dying so he can stay in, I wish I had somebody, so he can stay in control. Are you with me? So he has, oh God, Jesus, I don't have time, but he has you on suicide watch to make you a slave to the law, and the moment you try to kill yourself to end the law, and he takes the sheets out the room. And you wonder why we're stuck in the cycle? Because we're trying to do it. Let me read. Here's the illustration. Verse 2, for a married woman is bound by law to a husband while he lives. Now, women, don't nobody go kill your husband, all right? <laughs> let me, let me, y'all go see John Tay and, you know, and, and Reuben if you need that issue. So listen to this. She is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulterer if she lives with another man while her husband is still alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Lord Jesus. In the same way, or likewise, my brothers, you have also, what's the word? Died to the law. How? Through the what? Body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear what? We may bear what? Fruit, come on, say we may bear what? I, I, let me give you a heads up so you can stop it. Let me go there, okay? Let me go there, okay? For while we are living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work where? In our members to bear fruit for what? Death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in a new way the spirit and not in the old way the written code. Okay? Very, very important. So a body has to die. And notice what I said in C, that Christ's physical body was the vehicle of reconciliation. I'm going to go somewhere with this in a little while. So don't think physically you need to die. He did it for you. Okay, so he was the sacrificial lamb. He was the ultimate sacrifice. So you and I now can live a new life. You can make it. I can make it. We can make it. Okay, are you guys tracking with me? So now, watch this now. The goal of reconciliation is to present us holy in what? Ah, uh, Jesus, go back to Colossians. Go back to Colossians. Let me, let me, let me tell you about holy. Colossians chapter 1, and, and this is where verse 21 yeah, and then I'm going to go to the last thing I want to say. Okay, I want you all to get this. You there? And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh, okay, by his what? Death. In order to do what? Present you what? Holy and what? Blameless. And what else? Above reproach before who? Okay, I'm going to hit that last verse. One more time, verse 22. And he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you how? Holy and what else? Blameless and above what? Reproach before him. Let me give you some literary context real quick. Let me say this. The problem with the Colossian church and the heresy of the Gnosticism that was happening there is they were teaching the Colossian believers that Jesus, it was impossible for God to take on flesh and die in your place. So he was not incarnated, right? And then they were saying to him, it was literally impossible for one person to die for everything that you've done. And Paul now is, so, so in other words, y'all just a bunch of sinners. You might as well go and do what you got to do because nothing happened. And Paul is coming behind all that her, uh, heretical teaching, and he's teaching them that Jesus paid the price for sin, and if you accept him into your life as personal Lord and Savior, when he sees you, he didn't see what you did, he sees what he did for you. Oh, yeah. Y'all, let me tell you what, what, what excites me about that, is because I know who I used to be. 
you, you can act holy all day long, but I'm confident in saying you weren't always saved. Because by default, Psalm 51 and says that you were shaping iniquity and, and conceived in sin. So if you're under the sound of my voice, you ought to be thanking God that when he looks at you, he doesn't see what you did. He sees what he did for you. Come on, somebody that's a hallelujah. The problem with the church today is we act like we've been saved all our lives and we're afraid to tell the world, if God brought me out, God can bring you out. Come on. And we act as if we're holy and we condemn a brother or sister when we find them in sin and we forgot the truth that God came to die for you and he came to die for me. And the only reason we are blood washed is because of what he did on the cross of Calvary. Now, this is going to really mess you up. Your prayers are not keeping you saved. Are you with me? Your fasting is not keeping you saved. I, this is going to mess you up. Going to church is not keeping you saved. The only thing that's keeping you saved is the presence of God on the inside of your life that's preserving you. Quit acting like your works is keeping you saved. Because here's what we do. The more I pray, the more sinful you look. Stop the foolishness. You're just as sinful as the next thing. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your works. He sees his blood. I want you to hear me. This is very, very important. Because if you don't believe that he can keep you, you'll fool yourself into thinking that you can lose your salvation. And the only reason you'll say that, because you've been keeping yourself. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me this morning? But for the grace of God, we'd be the next homeless person on Colfax. But for the grace of God, some of our daughters would be the next prostitute out on the street. But for the grace of God, come on, I, I want y'all to hear me this morning. So you don't thank God for what you do, you thank God for what he, yeah, 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 you, you, You've got to hear me this morning. This is important stuff, okay? We must understand that his body died and the goal of reconciliation in spite of how messed up Felix is, in spite of how messed up Felix used to be, in spite of how many times Felix get tempted and all the crazy stuff that he goes through in the flesh, when he looks at me, he calls me son. Come on, say amen if you're hearing this. And so here's what the text says in Colossians. He presents me before his father. Oh, Jesus. Holy, blameless. Come on, is this making sense? Because it ain't so much what I did, but it's what he did for me. Uh, can we take a moment just to tell him thank you? Come on, just to tell him. Just a moment. Just a moment. Just a moment to tell him thank you. It says, we've reconciled us. He's brought me back by his death to present me holy, blameless, and I like this phrase, above reproach. There's nothing the enemy can tell him that I did that'll cause him to change his mind about me. Oh, talk to me this morning. Talk to me this morning. There is nothing the enemy can tell God that I did above reproach and and scripture tell you he's going to try because here how it says he is the accuser of the brethren so he's looking for you to do stuff so he can report what you did and god isn't looking for you to do stuff he knows what he did i wish i had somebody in here and he looks at what he did does this make sense guys now let me deal with that conditional clause look at verse 23 and i don't know how far we're going to get but I want you to understand this. If indeed you what? In the faith, how? 
stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Somebody's already saying, hold up, preacher, that sounds contradictory. Didn't you just say I ain't got to do nothing? He did it all. Now this is saying, if I stay in the faith, if I stay steadfast, if I stay stable, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, which I heard, which has been proclaimed, what's, what's up with that? It seems like I need to do something for me to reap my reward. Now let me help you with this in the last statement. Number two, just look at number two. Say, believers are to stand firm. Say, I must stand firm. Here's what stand firm means. Let me read it. If the gospel teaches that the final perseverance of the saints, I'll explain that. It teaches at the same time that the saints are those who finally persevere. And then the next sentence says, in Christ, continuance is the test of reality. That's a crazy statement. Let me explain it. If the gospel teaches that the final, if the gospel teaches the final perseverance of the saints, that means if the word of God teaches that you can't lose your salvation, that God's going to keep you, if it teaches that, okay, it also teaches at the same time that the saints are those who make it to the end, okay? And then notice what it says. In Christ, continuance is the test of reality. Help this. Let me help y'all. It's okay to get quiet right here because this is deep. If I go to an apple tree, I was looking for somebody who had fruit, and I pick an orange off of the apple tree, is it an apple tree? Yeah. It can tell me it's an apple tree all it wants, but if it's producing oranges, continuance is the test of reality. All I have to do is go to the tree and the type of fruit that I pick from it tells me what kind of tree it really is. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the tree says. Are you with me? If, if I go to a grapevine and I'm picking strawberries... Is it a grapevine or is it a strawberry patch? You kind of get what I'm saying? Now, 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 let me help y'all. A grapevine that produces grape and an apple tree that produces apple could have good apples and it can have bad apples. But fact remains, it's still, yeah. Come on, are, are you guys tracking with me? Are you with me? So here's how Jesus said it in John. I am the vine and you are the branches. He says, abide in me for apart from me you can do nothing. Every branch that's in me, the Father prunes so it can bear more fruit. Come on. But if it isn't bearing fruit, in other words, if you come to my grapevine and you're finding strawberries, he cuts it off. So here's what Colossians is saying. If you continue in the faith, if Christ finished the work in you and the seed is in you, you can't produce anything that doesn't look like him. Are you with me? Okay. So, so, so let me go back here and because I want you all to get this real quick. The problem with a lot of us, and here's the Old Testament theology and concept, right? Um, he takes Gentiles, and listen to the words that he used, and he grafts them in with the Jews to make them one people. But when grafting occurs, one plant must die to take on the character traits of the other. The problem with a lot of us that's producing apple orange, <laughs> or grape strawberry, depending on the season,
Because if you're watching my team play, your season might not be right. You know, <laughs> some stuff might come out. You know, depends on who you're talking to, depending. Come on, are you with me? The, the beauty about trees that are consistent, that have been completely grafted, is the fruit is consistent. Come on, talk to me, y'all. So go with me. Go with me here. Let me leave you with this. Go to Romans chapter 6, and here's what I want to do. Go to Romans chapter 6. Go to Romans chapter 6. Ah, this is going to help us. I'm telling you, this is going to help somebody because it's helping me. Romans chapter 6. Go to verse 1. Say amen if you're there. Now let me clean this up. Watch this. What shall we say then? Some of your translation have brothers and sisters. Are we to continue or go on sinning that grace may abound? And let me, let me explain that phrase, grace may abound. Here's the deal. Because you are in the vine, it doesn't mean that you will not sin. Are you with me? Here's the beauty of being in the vine. There's this third person of the Trinity called the Holy Spirit. Because he's in you, a lot of times before you even do it, he tells you no. Well, let me, let me clean that up. Every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me clean that up. He tells you no. Why are you saying that, preacher? Because Corinthians kind of puts it this way. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but will, with every temptation, provide a way out so you can stand up under it. So here's what that means. Before you dial the number to call him or her, you've already been convicted. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. And, and for those that ignore the conviction shortly after the sin, he shows up again. Come on, is this making sense? So here's what Paul says. Does that mean that it gives us a license to continue to sin knowing that God will forgive us? Here's the response. No. Verse 2. I like this. How can we, I love the pronouns inclusive, who died to sin live in it and he what? Longer. Look at verse 3. Do you not know that all of us, okay, leaving the implication there might be some who have not yet partook. All of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into the death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too may walk in newness of life. Look at verse 5. For if we have been united, notice the conditional case again, assuming you have been united with him in death in like his he will certainly be united in resurrection in life and we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing watch we heard this before today so that we would no longer be enslaved or slaves to sin for one who has died has been free from sin now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. So the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Thirteen. I mean 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. I got I, I, one more. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. This is one of these messages that you never hear anymore because people want to tell you, take a hanky, go put it on a car, walk around it seven times, and you can get a new car. <laughs> or sow a seed of faith and God's going to give you a house, but you can move all your boyfriends in the house with you. Right? Nobody is saying be holy anymore. Nobody is saying bear fruit for Christ anymore. The importance of this Colossian hymn 
is by virtue of the fact that God inhabited the vehicle we know as Christ. Christ was empowered to live a sinless life on the earth, even though tempted. And when we accept Christ in our life as personal Lord and Savior, we are now empowered to be different in the earth realm. Let me say it this way. So when we do sin, it's not because we have to or we can't help ourselves. It's simply because the flesh is stronger than the spirit. Okay, now this is deep. If that thing has you so that you can't break it, no matter how hard you try, you might just want to check to see which vine you're connected to. I, I have to say that. It's no different than me fooling myself into thinking I've been healed from cancer and I stopped taking the chemo and I stopped going, taking the radiation and going, stopped going to doctors because I fooled myself into believing that I'm healed when I'm actually not. Then when I die, I want to blame God, right? It's no different than the person who refuses to accept Christ in their life as Lord and Savior and allow him to live for them. Then when the end comes and he says, depart from me, you work of iniquity, don't make the mistake of saying, but I sang in the worship team and I served on the Ursher board and I was a deacon. And I, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. If he's not in you and you've been doing it and him not doing it for you, you're not going to make it in. Guys, I'd like to preach the pretty stuff, but this is one of those ugly things that I have to say. Because I want you to have a hope of the gospel to make it into heaven. Are you hearing me this morning? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Because the enemy is trapping us too much. Okay? Salvation and sanctification says that the enemy might have a hold on me on this one thing. But the moment I surrender myself to God and give that thing over to God, I don't let sin reign. I allow God to live through me. Okay? Here's what I taught you in the prayer series. Take the thought captive. Okay? Now I am saying to you, you have the ability to stop, not because of who you are, but because of who is in you. Come on, come on, is this making sense? So if we stay in a sin situation, it's not because we can't help ourselves. It's simply because we don't trust God to deliver us from it. And God wants to present you holy. But here's what that really says. He only presents holy those who really belong to him. So I want to challenge you this morning. Do you really belong to him? And I'm going to say this. If you don't know, do not make the mistake of leaving here under assumptions. I'm a grandfather. I have three grandkids that are growing up in church. My concern for my grandkids is that they not grow up in church and then assume they're saved because they've been in church all their life. <laughs> Those of us that were brought up in church, we make that mistake. Come on. We know the hymns. We know the songs. We know, we know the moves. We know everything. But have we really surrendered to God? So I want to ask you this morning. Search your heart. Scripture says, for in them we think we have life. And if you don't remember a point where you've given your heart to God, I just want to invite you. You got nothing to lose. Let God be God. Let God be God. Let God be God. Because when we come to him, we die with him and he empowers us to make it. Then the body of Christ can come along you and side you and walk with you on how to live this new life. Our intercessory team can pray with you to help you deal with those demons that might be influencing you. We can talk about all that stuff. But it begins with having an intimate, personal relationship with him. 